Language is the foundational sort of academic skill that's going to allow children to be <laughs> successful in school. We also know that strong reading skills in English are essential for academic success in the U.S. From my point of view, the ticket to a middle class life in this country is the child's eligibility for college. And those, in order to be eligible for college, kids must take the SAT or the ACT and they're only given in English. And what, one of the issues for, um, for those of us who work around dual language is, you know, people often think that what we are focusing on is a goal that doesn't include English. No, it does include English. We just talk about it in different ways. It doesn't have to be at the expense of a first language, okay? Um, so, but there's no doubt about it. High proficiency in English is a goal. We, we can't let people be confused about that. So how do we accomplish that when children already have a language and that language is not English? And what's the, one of the things that I ask, we asked in some of our studies then, when how much of achievement is due to language status? The fact that a child has a language other than English in the home versus the child that come from a low income family versus that they're from an ethnic minority family. And that's huge. When you design interventions, you need to know. What is the impact of, let's say, a family who comes to this country and does not speak English in the home, um, and, the, and the whole family speaks a language other than English? What is the impact of that versus the impact of um, a family who's been here, maybe second generation, the parents and the children still speak Spanish, but they're in a very low income bracket? Okay, so we need to have some way of disaggregating this, of thinking about these things, because as a country, what we've tended to do is to land on, these children are disadvantaged because they have a language other than English. And people say that all the time. If you just listen, I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of, of perceptual abilities to listen to the news reports. I go to Washington quite a bit and I meet with um, policymakers, and they will say things. The burden of speaking Spanish in the home. This child is disadvantaged, etc. So they believe the fact that they have this other language is in some way going to hinder the child's achievement in English. This is an unconscious belief. In fact, or the fact that children are minority. So let me ask you this. We actually did a study on, this, um, on children of different language backgrounds and SES status from this huge national data sample of about 22,000 children. Children who come into this country with their families and they speak an Asian language, Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, etc. Okay, when you test them and compare them to monolingual English speakers at the kindergarten, how would you think they would test? So what we did was we disaggregated by language and by SES. And this particular sample had four language categories, Asian, European, Spanish, and English. Okay. So, at kindergarten entry, children who come from Asian-speaking families, in other words, that's their first language, they were exposed to English at school, they actually scored lower than their English-speaking peers. By third grade, they exceeded on every measure, on every academic content measure. Now, and remember, the Asian-speaking background, that's very diverse. What about children from European-speaking backgrounds? Okay, they came to this country, their families speak a European language. Bosnian, German, French, not Spanish. How would you think they would compare? Interestingly enough, children whose families speak a European language, they're immigrants to this country, their children actually score higher at every assessment period. Every single testing period on every single academic subject matter, these children test higher. So language did not hold them back. This was not um, a dampener on their overall academic interest, but they did not speak English in the home. They, so, it, it throws into question some basic assumptions. Actually, if you mapped on European, Asian, 
Spanish, English. If you just looked at the SES and mapped it onto achievement, it's almost a perfect correlation. So that families that come here with the European speaking background tend to be clustered in the two highest quintiles for SES, so high levels of family income and education, yes. Absolutely, and children from Asian backgrounds are much more evenly distributed across the whole SES continuum, so you get much greater variety. Um, and then Spanish speaking, what would you say? Right, so, so that they, they actually do, the children who come from homes that speak Spanish are clustered in the lowest two quintiles for SES, 80% in fact, and um, they tend to achieve at the lowest levels, and they're the highest proportion of all children that we would identify as, as English language learners. Um, but if you separate out children who come from an SES, or from a Spanish-speaking home, and they don't have low SES, they achieve at comparable, comparable rates as monolingual English speakers. So there's a huge confound around SES and language in this country. It's the fact that a child has another language in the home is not um, is not a risk factor necessarily. Although if you look at almost any any like screening tool that will say is this child eligible for the program because they're at risk, they will almost say, always say they don't speak English in the home. People still view this as somehow a disadvantage. David Dickinson's longitudinal research, and he's been looking at this over time with kids that are now in fifth and sixth and seventh grade. And what he's finding out is that what happens during that pre-K year can contribute more to fourth grade reading than the fact that the child's low income.